In case you haven't noticed, both of the big console manufacturers are having a bit of a bad time. Most recently, the Xbox president, Sarah Bond, has gotten herself and her company in the news. This is all because of a disastrous interview. She was asked why Tango Gameworks, the people who made Hi-Fi Rush, had to be shut down, and she really didn't have any form of reasonable answer. So we're going to dive into that, and basically work out some of why Xbox Studios appears to be an ongoing disaster. But of course, over in the land of the PlayStation, things are not getting any easier. They are approaching the launch of Ghost of Tsushima on PC. I've got to say that as an enjoyer of games, I am extremely excited for that. I mean, a game of that fidelity with such an amazing art style, absolutely to the tits with all that a PC can throw at it, that is such an exciting prospect. But it's also gonna be a problem for a lot of people. The whole PSN issue is seriously impacting them, right? It's actually meant even more sales restrictions, even more refunds, and of course, even more bad press for PC audiences, and that is rough because I think this is a game that, by all accounts, should do absolutely amazingly on the PC platform. In both cases, though, neither of these companies has anything good to say. They have not been able to work out good actions, but if you want to take a good action, you can check out Bellular.Games. That's actually where we publish all of our videos. They go up there as soon as they're ready. They're ad-free. It's also where we publish a loading screen, which basically means that loading screen gets you all of the news, into your inbox every day, including lots of stories that can't really fit into videos, news about upcoming game releases, even games that do come out and end up being sleeper hits. It's one of the myriad of things that we do over there. It's, of course, really fun to hang out with everyone on the Members Lounge Discord. And I think in the more, like, you know, big scale, like, serious front, it really does help our sustainability. And that means, of course, that we can continue to go as hard as we can on our mission to bring you the news. And speaking of that, oh boy, there's some news. So, at the Bloomberg Tech Conference, journalist uh, Dina Bass got to interview Sarah Bond, the president of Xbox. And in any normal week, this would have been a very straightforward, investor-focused thing, right? It would have been so boring, we would not be talking about it. But in the wake of closing four studios, it obviously wasn't a normal week. And that means that Sarah Bond has inadvertently became the story herself. In the interview, she did just kind of rattle off the usual Xbox press lines, that the industry is changing, that it's beginning to slow down in terms of growth. Like, actually, they're, they're not getting lots of new players, and Microsoft are trying to capitalize on that with things like cloud gaming and with Game Pass. But even in Game Pass, a recent story has been just how much the growth of that has stagnated. And I can certainly say from the prospect of co-running a game studio, and um, I suppose via that, just having a little bit of insight into the funding landscape, everybody in the indie scene knows that Game Pass deals are not something that, uh, well, they're just not something that people are getting as much these days. It is way harder. Microsoft are, you know, they, they are tightening the coin purse. The explanation that we got from Sarah when asked about the layoffs and Tango Gameworks in particular was, it was not great. So IGN transcribed it. I am going to read you the transcription. This is what Sarah said. You know, it's always extraordinarily hard when you have to make decisions like that, Bond said. I'll go back to what I was saying about the industry. And when we look at those fundamental trends, we feel a responsibility to ensure that the games we make, the devices we build, the services that we offer are there through moments, even when the industry isn't growing and when you're through a time of transition. And the news we announced earlier this week is an outcome of that, and our commitment to make sure that the business is healthy for the long term. Amazing, deep, meaningful words from the president. It really is a funny situation, isn't it? That is what we call a deflection, right? I mean, Sarah, you're not playing Sekiro. I mean, I know you want to parry, but that's not how this combat system works. Uh, you tried to parry, we all noticed that, and uh, your HP has just taken some damage. At no point does she actually explain why those studios were cut. Just that not having Tango Gameworks or Arcane Austin will be a long-term healthy move. Now, of course, if you are like me, or maybe even if you're like yourself, you might be thinking, well, 
I thought Hi-Fi Rush was a big success. Microsoft said it was a big success by all metrics. Hi-Fi Rush 2? Would that not be a good thing? A long-term healthy move. Building out a new brand. Microsoft making new IP. The idea of Arcane Austin may be returning to Dishonored, making a immersive sim. In a world where Microsoft is particularly struggling to release first-party titles, surely that's the sort of thing that would have been a long-term healthy move. Because really, these all do look like very short-term moves, Sarah. Normally, that would be that, but here's the good news. The journalist in question actually wanted to do a good job. Therefore, that bullshit answer from Sarah was not taken. Some pushback was actually given, right? And unfortunately for Sarah, it did mean that she was put in a rather awkward position because Hi-Fi Rush was a success by Xbox's own admission, meaning that the closure of that studio really did not make sense. Now, you would also think that big potentially, maybe not evil, but just wholly uncaring, you would think that a company like Microsoft would intensely workshop a answer, right? That their PR team would be drilling, uh, you know, drilling with Sarah, trying to practice these awkward questions. With that in mind, here's what Sarah said. You know, one of the things I really love about the games industry is it's a creative art form. And it means that the situation and what successes for each game in the studio is really unique. There's no one size fits all for us. And so we look at each studio, each team. We look at a whole variety of factors when we're faced with making decisions and trade-offs like that. But it all comes back to our long-term commitment to the games we create, the devices we build, the services, and ensuring that we're setting ourselves up to be able to deliver on those promises. That was Sarah's answer. And you know what's worse, I would say, than corporate deflection? I think uh, suggesting that subjective measures of success mean that even if the people who own you say that you are successful by every metric, that it doesn't actually matter. Sarah's response is awful. She essentially said, you'll be let go regardless of a sensible rationale or one that we're willing to communicate publicly, that there are unique circumstances that don't reflect their work to date, that of course they're not willing to share or explain. What we've actually learned here is that Xbox PR have actually not worked out what the company line is. Xbox do not know how to spin this story. Essentially, in a situation like this, you need a spin doctor. You need the Alistair Campbell, I suppose, of, uh, you know, of Xbox to get everybody in shape and to get the party line worked out. They don't have that. And that means that they don't have any reasonable answer that leaves them looking like fools and worse because there is no easy to understand uh, sort of process here for people who work at Microsoft Studios, all that this does is further the feeling of unease, of not knowing, and it even fosters hopelessness. Because if your game completely crashes and burns, you can sort of understand that. If they ended up taking the decision to close Arcane Austin, and they basically said, listen, Redfall was obviously a challenging development, there was high staff turnover, and we just don't feel that this studio is really able to, uh, you know, to do its job and it doesn't make sense for us to have it be a support studio. Therefore, we're going to close the studio and reallocate some of its staff elsewhere. That is the sort of thing that people could actually believe, that people could understand. But when it's a situation like with Tango, where it's Hi-Fi Rush, a game that is brilliant, a game that Microsoft have said is brilliant, a game that Microsoft said exceeded their expectations, and a game that was used as the vanguard of their multi-platform publishing scheme, right? Then putting it on PlayStation. It doesn't make sense. They have no way to make it sense to people. And when bad things happen that people can't put into context, that people don't understand, guess what happens? They lose hope. And the problem with Xbox is they've consistently been saying the first party games will come. Starfield will come. It will help us. Halo Infinite will be a year late, but it'll be worth it. Game Pass, it's all for Game Pass. Don't worry about the other problems. We have a plan. Whereas Sony have just been delivering uh, another really good console and lots of really good games. Meanwhile, Steam, the PC platform, has been doing amazingly for gaming. So. Xbox have continually been trading off trying to say that they have a good strategy and hope. 
and all they are doing is crushing that. <laughs> What's even funnier is this, this incredible shot from the Bloomberg production team where we see Xbox's declining growth, but it still is absolutely massive. And that being presented during Bond's description of the layoffs being as a result of decisions and trade-offs. The recent year-over-year -year growth, while it is declining, it is very, very, very big. And I think the problem here is, with that curve going down, they have evidently flinched. They have panicked, and they felt that they've needed to make these decisions. But what if that dip now is because you're investing in things like Hi-Fi Rush 2, like turning your arcane Austin asset into something that can be productive by redoubling on its, you know, its core competencies. Really, it is baffling, and I think that shot just shows it all. What Xbox did want us to know, though, is that they're launching their mobile gaming store this summer. Yes, and that was one of the key features of the mergers that they kept repeating, that they wanted King's experience to get into the mobile market. Uh, this is going to involve a web-only app store for the time being, launching with support for purchases in Xbox apps like Candy Crush and Minecraft, but eventually they'll open it up to partners. And if you're wondering why they're going to do a web store that just has their own games, basically the USA has not been forcing Apple or Google to open their platforms up fully to third-party stores. Now that still may happen. And then over in the EU, Apple are fighting the Digital Markets Act, of course, at every turn. But still, even with pushback from the platform holders, Microsoft essentially just wants a way that people can buy whatever in-game currencies are there for something like Candy Crush, where they just have to give less of a cut to Apple. Now, for more directly gaming-related news, there was some talk about how the multi-plat Xbox games have gone, the likes of, say, Sea of Thieves. Bond basically said that they were encouraged by the reception, but, of course, did not want to share specifics. So she didn't have information on hand, but the PlayStation blog actually did. They released the results of April downloads, and it actually turns out that Xbox multi-plat games did well. Sea of Thieves was third in US, Canada, first in EU, Grounded was 9th in US, Canada, and 8th in EU, which is fairly good. And again, considering that the only games that beat Sea of Thieves in the Americas were Helldivers 2 and Stellar Blade, both platform exclusives, I think that does point to a fairly successful result. If only success was something that Xbox used to determine whether studios closed or not. But speaking of PlayStation, that leads me to our next topic, because they've also had a rather bad week. For two generations, Sony have been at the top of the console space. That's our context here. They have controlled the market through PlayStation Network. They have dominated, but now the industry is getting tighter. They need more money, and that has brought them to the PC platform, which has obviously meant a bit of a fundamental flaw in their entire business model. PlayStation, despite being globally successful, are not actually global, and that is why the Ghost of Tsushima store page looks like this days ahead of launch, right? We actually see this like banner warning that is there. So that's quite something. And then when you take a look at the back end, well, SteamDB are pointing out that Helldivers 2 purchase restrictions were actually updated to add the Baltics. And then further to that, Ghost of Tsushima has now got the same purchase restrictions. And the reason why there, like it does make a, a lot of sense. Basically, PSN is not available in those regions. And Sony would be in a situation where if PSN isn't available in your region, but you know, you need PSN to play a multiplayer component, then Sony would be basically asking you to break their own terms of service, right? That would obviously be a mess. Now, Sony do not want to implement a third-party moderation system for accounts. They don't want to do an account system like, say, BattleEye. They already have one, the one they built for PlayStation Network. And that means that nearly 200 countries under Sony's own terms of service cannot actually make an account. And that means that people in those regions cannot buy games even if it is just required for the multiplayer function, not core single player. So that means if you're in the Baltics and you want to play Ghost of Tsushima and you only want to play single player, unfortunately, screw you. Sony don't want to be in a position where their products are only partially usable by customers or be tacitly saying, hey, buy our game, break our terms of service, we want your money. They can't do that. And this is Sony's decision. This was confirmed by Johan uh, Pilstedt, who is the CEO of Arrowhead, or the people who make Helldivers 2. He said that, yes, it was um, updated to be unavailable for purchase in several more reasons, and he explained what the situation was. Now, Valve, they have cleaned up some details to match, but the people making the calls here are Sony. Now, fortunately, Ghost of Tsushima is not out yet. 
And that means that Steam is automatically refunding people who purchased the game, like, you know, who pre-ordered in those regions. So those refunds are automated, which of course you'd bloody well hope they are. Um, but again, as we can see from that message from Johan, very much this is still an ongoing conversation. Sony have basically been caught with their pants down here. They haven't been able to give any form of actual resolution. And that just means that right now they're days away from a major release and they are somewhat screwed. And at the same time, live service is still a major part of Sony's plans. They are working on a bunch of them. Those will likely depend on PSN in some way for moderation. And that kind of means that Sony is in crisis. And in crisis, the first thing that you got to do is triage, right? Right? you can't actually solve the problem immediately. So, from Sony's perspective, again, big company, they are thinking about risk, reducing it as fast as they can. And in PlayStation's case right now, that means that they are not asking potential customers to break terms of service or to buy a game that they cannot fully use. And the reason there, well, in some cases will be to minimize legal risk, to minimize bad press. And yes, they have got bad press, but that press could be worse. It means that they don't have to deal with Valve asking why they are processing even more refunds and you know, potentially eating some costs there in terms of payment processing. But of course, it doesn't solve the actual problem, which is that for unspecified reasons, PSN does not support loads of regions when you sign up. But of course, Steam's store, other than the locally uh, you know, prohibitive versions that are in China and Vietnam, Steam is global. So you just have a fundamental mismatch in platforms. Like remember, Sony sell game consoles. They've never had to do PSN in such a way that it would support regions where they do not sell consoles, right? Um, or, you know, where they maybe had people, say, signing up but just making fake accounts. Now, in that latter case, it was actually a negligible audience unless there was, you know, some sort of additional problem with an account. So for Sony, it didn't really matter if you used a VPN to sign up. But now the scale is larger, the potential, right, of, you know, bad press or really bad customer service problems, that's much higher. And that's why they put a tourniquet on to stop the bleeding. But the structural surgery to fix this problem, that takes time because it means changing on a technical level how PSN is working, right? So it very much is the tourniquet analogy. You put the tourniquet on and okay, you've bought some time. That person needs to get to a field hospital or whatever. And then the tourniquet needs to come off because as you know, if a tourniquet is on for too long, then uh, you can very much get the bad blood and die. Their immediate stop the bleeding, reduce our liability problem. Yes. That, that, that's been a problem and they've they've basically solved that. But now they're left with a really bad fundamental situation that they were not ready for, not technically, not in terms of public relations. And to tie our two stories together, what we essentially see is two companies having problems and not being in a position to give their customers or even their investors clear answers, clear explanations about why any of this is going on. And ultimately, that just makes them look like clowns. It makes press, customers, and even investors trust them less. Yeah, I suppose it's that thing that I sometimes in my head call stupidity at scale. It's the idea. I mean, you know how it is. A small group of people, they can work together and be as a whole more intelligent. If you just keep on adding people and departments and chains of command and more chains of command and processes and sign-offs. It's not just that your returns are diminishing. I think your returns are actually negative. So as you add people, you, know, you can do more and you can do more. And then actually you suddenly start doing less and are more stupid. I think that's why a lot of this corporate stupidity happens. Think of ants in an ant colony, the sort of macro-organism that is this corporation. It just hasn't evolved in a way where it can deal with these problems. At the very least, we all get to laugh about it. And uh, I suppose mostly as PC gamers, we got freedom. We got freedom that they don't have. So that's it for today's video. Let me know though, what are your thoughts on this? If you know anything about the Tango Gameworks story, I would seriously love to know. Uh, Sarah Bond ain't given us answers, so hopefully somebody leaks. Anyway. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. There is more on the channel and I will be back tomorrow. So thanks for hanging out with me and I'll see you then.